activity, right? Stuff happens out in the environment, and um, stuff happens a lot, and nothing results from that. But sometimes stuff happens, and there's a, a perceptive observer combined with the stuff that happens, and out of that um, come conventions, discoveries, and so on. You'll know lots of stories, surely, of that kind of thing. How did we discover fire? How do we discover champagne? Uh, things of that nature. If we think about learning this way, um, there's lots of learning in human history and improvement that's, and major improvements and discoveries that have happened by this. Um, but we're just kind of waiting for it to happen, right? And it's kind of a happenstance thing. Can we do better than that? Uh, informed observation is really an attempt to, to do better than that to try and um, improve on the pure serendipity process. So how do we make sure that naturally occurring information, informative events, are brought to the attention of the perceptive observer um, so that we can try and maximize the opportunity to learn from experience? So that's what I'm calling informed observation. So you've been sat down for long enough now. It's time to, uh, um, to get you moving around and, uh, and active this morning. Um, some of you uh, are lucky enough to have a packet of materials on your table, about half of a table. If you could raise your hands if you have a packet of materials at your table. So they're kind of dispersed somewhat through the, through the audience here. Um, you will find in that packet of materials a, an already pre-cut helicopter template. Um, so all you have to do is the assembly. It's, you know, it's not going not gonna to be hard work here. Um, some paper clips kind of holding the packet together. Um, I'm assuming that you have a pencil or a pen already at your table. If you don't, I have backup ones in the, in the bag at the back. I'm also assuming, given uh, Kentaro's presentation yesterday, that there's a ubiquity of technology available. Um, <laughs> and therefore, you have some means of, uh, of timing at your disposal um, and even calculating, even if it's calculating in your head. Um, and then in the packet, there's also tally sheets and chart paper. All right. so. Um, what's already been pre-cut for you is this helicopter template. Um, here, you may say this doesn't look much like a helicopter, um, um, but you trust me, you're going to have an awesome experience with this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what you do with this to construct this helicopter um, is you, you take those tabs, A and B, that have already been cut along the solid lines, you fold them together in the middle, and then you and then you use um, paper clips, paper clip or clips, whatever's been provided, um, to hold that together. And then C and D, you fold in opposite directions to make the wings. Um, so this is like one. Of, so this thing flies like those, like the the little twirly bird seeds, right? Um, so. You, so what you get to do is you get to select um, a pilot for the helicopter, get to select a timekeeper, um, a record keeper to record the times, um, a plotter to uh, plot the data out, so um, four defined roles, and then everybody else can be ground crew um, whose job is observation or divided by harassment. Oops, I didn't clean that one up. And so how do, you, how do you go about doing this, right? You have the pilot hold the helicopter up. 
to have the <coughs> make sure the timekeeper has a clear view of the of the um, of the pilot, um, and uh, the timekeeper says start, which time they they start uh, recording recording the flight. The the pilot lets go of the helicopter, um, and then the timekeeper measures the the uh, the length of the flight, the time taken for the flight. Announces what that time is. The record keeper records the time down on the sheet. So there's 20 spaces on the sheet, so you get to do 20 flights. Um, and that form also has um, the uh, spaces to calculate moving range and the and the uh, MR bar and MR bar over D2 and all of the stuff you'd need to calculate control limit. So just after creating a moment of anxiety there where you might actually have to do some of this advanced math at this time in the morning, I'm going to assuage your fears and say you don't actually have to do that, but you can do that at your leisure or your pleasure if that's, that's the kind of thing that uh, you know, gets you geeked up in the morning like it would me. Um, <laughs> So really for now, you just have to record the times. And, and then the record keeper plots the times on the graph. So we're done when you've got kind of the times plotted on the graph over time. Um, you're, you're probably going to have to wait at least until you've got a few times so you've got an idea of, of what the range of times is for the scale on the graph, uh, maybe to the end of the experiment if you have to. Um, and that's it. Um, so. This is, uh, um, you're not allowed to ask questions um, for the, the uh, this, this, is, this is like a real world situation where you've been, been given um, deliberately vague instructions from management <laughs> and you're expected to use your best judgment as to how to um, go about performing the task. Um, so that afterwards, the, I can come around and say, well, that wasn't what I wanted at all. And, um, all right. So that's it. If you want to get to, uh, I'm going to say let's, uh, let's target um, seven minutes for doing the experiment. Let's go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to join a table that has has materials and participate um, in their experiment. Um. Somebody crash landed at night, that's what it was. <laughs> I was hitting your, uh, your name oh, okay, thank you. Thanks. Oh no. <laughs> Thank
<laughs> I think I work comp claim. <laughs> 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 All right, so it looks it looks like the flights have, flights have come to an end, so I assume the, the plotting is going on. So I assume, I assume that uh, you experienced some variation in results. <coughs> so if we can start uh, heading back to the tables. So Walter, Walter Schuhart um, came up with a distinction a number of years ago, back in the 20s, between common and special causes of variation. Um, common causes of variation are those causes that are inherently part of the process or system, um, hour after hour, day after day, 
and they affect every observation made on the processor system. Don't affect every observation in the same way, um, but they're consistently present. Special causes of variation are those causes that are not part of the process or system all the time, um, only having effect on some of the observations made on the process or system. A, uh, a process or a system that has only common causes of variation um, is, uh, is called a stable process or a process that's in a state of statistical control. Um, it doesn't obviously mean there's no variation in, in outcomes of the process um, or that the amount of variation that's observed is necessarily small um, or even that it meets whatever the customer expectations or requirements uh, might be for the output of the process. But it does mean that, that within statistical limits that the output of continuation of the same process is predictable. Um, two types of mistake were also identified in the interpretation of causes of variation. Um, mistake one being concluding that an observation made on a process or system is due to a special cause when in fact it's due to the system, i.e. common causes. A mistake two being to conclude that an observation made on a process or system is due to the system um, or common causes when in fact it's due to a special cause. And as, as, uh, as Dr. Deming used to say, um, you can guarantee that you don't make either one of these mistakes. You can never make mistake one or you can never make mistake two. So the only way you can do that is by maximizing the frequency with, with, with which you make the other mistake. So the control chart, the Schuhart's control chart, um, was an attempt to balance in an effective way um, the proportion of the time with which you make the, these two mistakes so that overall it's effective from a, from a learning standpoint. Uh, I don't know, how many, how many people have read the fifth discipline? So you may be familiar with, um, so fifth discipline, the subtitle of that book is Art and Practice of the Learning Organization. Um, and so Senge talks about a number of learning disabilities in that, in that book. And uh, two of those learning disabilities, one is focus on events. Does that look like either one of those mistakes? Looks well, pretty similar to mistake one, right? That everything's a special cause. Um, so you're always kind of treating every particular event as if it's special. The other learning disability in there is boiled frog. Are you familiar with boiled frog? <laughs> so a frog, if you put it in a pan of cold water and, and you slowly increase the temperature one degree every minute or two minutes or something like that, never reacts and eventually gets boiled to death. Now, if you drop it in hot water, it jumps right out. Um, and so this is the, the boiled frog syndrome, that things that happen kind of slowly and progressively over time don't necessarily get noticed and you end up, end up being boiled to death. Um, so so boiled frog, frog kind of uh, looks somewhat similar to mistake two there, right? That, uh, um, we're uh, um, interpreting uh, everything as, as being a common cause where there may be some underlying special cause that's, in this case, a special cause that's kind of a slow, progressive boiling to death. Look, it's a lovely metaphor, right? <laughs> so. All right, so, so I, I did, a, did the experiment I just asked you guys to do, and, uh, and this is the plot of results from the first time that, uh, that I ran that experiment. So all I've done here is I've just plotted them over time. I haven't put um, control limits and so on um, on this process for interpretation. Um, but I wanted to stop to make the point that I think we take a big step forward just plotting the data over time. Even if you don't put control limits on it, 
and you just simply plot the data over time, now when you're looking at the, any, any individual result, you're looking at that result in the context of the remaining variation displayed over time. So um, I think that's a, that's a fairly significant step forward. Um, but you know, if we leave it at that and say, well, so just do that and then um, kind of try and pick out the special causes from the common causes of variation um, within the result, um, we might not all come to the same conclusion. If, if I do it, or you do it, or you do it, um, are we really going to put the, make that decision in a consistent manner? Um, so when Schuhart uh, looked at the, the, the idea of, the, of um, statistically controlled variation, or stable variation, he started off with, with this uh, he, he, was, he was a person who'd really done a lot of philosophical inquiry. He'd read um, a lot of C.I. Lewis, his work, and so on. And, uh, and so he, he understood um, a number of distinctions that, that I don't think are commonly um, well understood. Um, so what he started with here is, is this concept of statistically controlled variation. And so this is an ideal, an, an idea. Um, so I have an idea in my head of what statistically controlled variation is. Do you have the same idea in your head of what statistically controlled variation is? Um, we can use metaphors. So he had the metaphor of the idealized bowl experiment, which is very similar to Deming's um, red bead experiment, where he's repeatedly sampling beads from a bowl calculating a proportion of a particular color, returning them to the, to the bowl. Um, and he can say, we can, we can think of that kind of an example as this kind of limiting state to which we might approach in the, in the control of variation from, from a process. But it's still, in a metaphor, it's still a concept. Um, in order to put communicable meaning into that concept, we need, to de we need to operationally define it. And so um, the language is a little confusing because Schuhart talked about statistical control as a concept, an operation, and a judgment. So I just said, well, you need to, you need to operationally define that. Is that, that the operation? Um, no, it's the judgment. Um, so the judgment, do we or do we not have an example of a state of statistical control in front of us? <clears throat> a method um, that you and I can both apply and we come to the same conclusion. So when we do that um, <clears throat> and then we use the term statistical control, we know that if we've applied this method to the same underlying set of data, we both mean, we both have agreement. We both mean the same thing in practice. So this third term, the control chart as a judgment, um, is that determination and putting communicable meaning into the concept. In the middle is an operation. Um, the operation, in, in that, Schuhart's talking about this as a method by which we bring about a state of statistical control. Um, so there's three separate ideas here, and what I'm going to do is kind of run through a series of actions or experiments um, to try and illustrate um, these distinctions. So this is, this is the kind of chart that you can, if you fill in all those other boxes on your tally sheet and do those calculations, you can calculate upper and lower control limits um, for, the, for the, your, your helicopter experiment. Um, and in the case of the experiment that, that I did, um, two points show up as special causes of variation. So these are the points where it makes sense to say, what happened? What went wrong? What, or what changed? What was different? What was special about the circumstances that gave rise to that particular point of data? And in the case of the one that, that I did, um, the first special cause, it landed on a chair instead of landing on the floor. The last one, um, 
when I let go of it, I think I was probably gripping the helicopter a little high and it kind of caught on my fingers before it was leaving. And, and so, so we got a little bit of extra release time in there. So two things showed up as special causes of variation. And this is where we, we look at the, so just looking at this chart and we say, okay, we've made this judgment that this process is not in a state of statistical control or it's an unstable process. Um, it's afflicted by special causes of variation. We've made that judgment. You and I can make the same judgment um, about that process. But what about an operation? Right here, right? We're talking about a method by which we achieve a state of statistical control. Well, if we're going to achieve something, then we have to make some change, right, that would result in improvement. Um, oh, let me, let me, uh, let me, um, instead of making that point that I just queued up here, let me make a different point because um, that's actually what the next slide is. <laughs> um, so, um, this process, or a series of experiments, does it look similar to this one? It is actually the same set of data, but um, to a quarter of a second. Whereas the first set of data was to, to um, hundredths of a second, which um, unquestionably is spurious accuracy as far as, <laughs> but oh yeah, so tip, hot tip here. Um, if, you, if you want to exude confidence and convince people, um, <laughs> use spurious accuracy. Um, so don't say like, well, it's about 5%. Say it's 5.78% and people will be um, awed by your confidence and belief in the thing. So, so in this case, right, we can, we can think, well, we look at, look at this and, and uh, you know, I know if, if I can only measure to a quarter of a second versus a hundredth of a second, it's a lower resolution measurement process. So I'm going to be, when, when changes occur in that process, I'm going to be less, less able to observe the change in the process. So we know, we know that intuitively, right? It's only, if I could only measure to the closest 10 seconds, there'd be no variability at all in these results. Um, so we, and, and, and the, own, and the, the uh, smallest change that I would be able to measure would be one that was at least 10 seconds in difference. So we know that, we know that we've got a, a resolution issue there. But notice also on this chart, these control limits are actually in slightly different place than the control limits on the previous chart because they're based upon this underlying set of data. Neither of those points that showed up as special causes on the first set of data show up as special causes on this set of data. So this is when you, when you talk about um, making a, a judgment about whether or not a process is in a state of statistical control it's that process isn't just the, the underlying process itself. It's that process confounded with the method of measurement by which you look at that process. They, they are, in, in what you're looking at, they are one and the same, one and the same thing. <coughs> so that's kind of a, like a diversionary um, thing, but it seemed like a cool thing to do. All right, so, so, um, so as a method, as an operation, a method by which you might achieve a state of statistical control, so the, we, we have this informed observation, right? We've been, um, that's where we've been, our attention has been directed towards these, these situations where we, we have a, an opportunity to learn. Um, we've identified these special causes of variation, and so the, the generic language would be, okay, so we eliminate the special causes of variation in order to try and achieve a state of statistical control. So that's the, the sense in which the control chart is, is, a, is an, an operational method by which you would achieve a state of statistical control, is that it guides the learning process by which, <coughs> by which you can gain 
the knowledge necessary to make the changes that might bring about a state of statistical control. So in this case, we identified two special causes. I landed on the chair, and, uh, um, and then the kind of the, the uh, fumbled flight um, finger thing. So we got some various options here, right? I could clarify that the definition of a valid flight, which I was fairly vague about <laughs> when I gave you guys the instructions, um, was the time for the helicopter um, from release to landing on the ground. And then that flight where it lands on the chair has been eliminated from the process because it's not a valid flight. Right? So um, effectively what I'm doing there is changing the method of measurement um, or definition um, of what constitutes a valid flight. Um, as far as like landing on the, on the chair, um, I could also move chairs out of the way. So it couldn't land on the chair. Um, so there's kind of a change in the process or the underlying structure um, by which you prevent that from being able to happen. Um, as far as like the fumbling with the helicopter, um, well, maybe my grip was inconsistent from, from um, flight to flight. I was holding the helicopter in a different place. I held it fairly high that time. It caught on my fingers. So I could improve the consistency of my grip. Maybe. Maybe I hold, always hold it where the paper clip is, or something like that, right? And then um, that would, um, if that was, the, if that's the reason, that would um, eliminate that special cause of variation from the from the process. So I did. I made those made those two changes, um, and and then ran the experiment again, <coughs> and. Uh, now you'll notice that from the first experiment to the second experiment, um, the, uh, the control limits have narrowed, um, so the results were more consistent. Um, the control limits aren't subject to those, um, the influence of special causes of variation in the underlying process. Um, the fact that you've identified particular points as being special causes doesn't mean that those special causes didn't influence other points in the data set. So even if you go through a methodology, which I, I would normally do with an individual moving range chart, which is to do the moving range chart, identify a special cause on the moving range chart, remove that moving range from the computation for the moving range chart, and iterate until um, no more special causes are, are identified on the moving range chart and then use that MR bar to calculate the individual's charts. So you think, okay, well, I've, I've removed the influence of those special causes on kind of inflating the control limits on the individual's chart. But that's not necessarily true because you don't really know that those special causes um, didn't, dependent on the nature of the special cause. You don't really know that that wasn't some influence on the other points. Okay, so anyway, after having made those two changes, it looks like um, we were successful in bringing about a state of statistically controlled variation, right? We, we have a control chart of results where all of the results um, fall within the limits. And, uh, and therefore, as in the red bead experiment, um, we, have a, we now have a basis for prediction. In the first experiment, when we had had uh, special causes of variation afflicting the process. Um, we really had no basis for prediction of, of what future results might be, uh, the range of future results might be. Now, we do. But do you remember the phrase that Dr. Deming used in the red bead experiment for, for being able to extend those control limits into the future? It's for extension of the Come on, somebody knows this. The same process. So is that a statistical prediction? So did, do you recall any of what Dr. Deming had to say about what he meant by extension of the same process? 
He said things like, same willing workers? No, that's fine. You can change out the willing workers. Same inspectors? Yeah, that's okay. You can change out, you can change out the inspectors. Same foreman? Yep. It's got to be the same, Dr. Denny. It's got to be the same foreman. Same beads? Yep. Has to be the same beads. Same paddle? Yes. Same instructions and procedure as far as angle at which the paddle has to go in and all of that stuff, right? Yes. None of that's statistical, right? So in that, Dr. Deming was making a judgment about when you said extension of the same process or continuation of the same conditions, it's not same, right? Like in terms of identical, right? That everything would be continued in the future and it'd be a perfect replication of exactly what happened. It would be where you're allowed to change certain things, but you're not allowed to change other things. So there's a judgment there of like, well, what are you allowed to change and what are you not allowed to change? That where's that judgment coming from? That judgment's coming from theory, right? Dem Deming, Dr. Deming had developed a theory there of, of what would matter and what wouldn't matter. And it was a combination of both past experience. He knows that he's run this experiment with multiple sets of willing workers, for instance and that he could extend the control limits from one experiment to another, and that the results of another experiment um, would fall within the control limits established from. And he went through that exercise in the, in the red beads experiment. Um, he'd also done other, other experiments. Like over the years, he didn't use the same bead over all the years he was doing the red bead experiment, he didn't always use the same red beads. He changed. He also changed paddles. So he had a, a beautiful apple wood paddle, for instance, at one point in time. And I think he lost it. Um, and it, somebody made him one that was kind of like out of a piece of phenolic, you know, with, with little dips and so on. The results changed. So, so he knew he had that experience, but there was also some, yeah, then what, 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 this doesn't make any sense. It's still got the same proportion of red beads in the, in the thing, and you put in a, so you put in a different paddle on. Well, but how were the red beads made? They took white beads and coated them. So the red beads are actually slightly larger than the white beads. Maybe. Maybe the material properties of the outside of the red bead are a little different than the material properties on the outside of the white bead. So they, they have a different chance of, therefore, of ending up in some place on the paddle. Maybe there's uh, electrostatic interaction between the material of the paddle and the, and the nature of the of beads. So all sorts of things, right? But can you see how kind of like Theory and also having tested this are coming together, and the nature of that prediction that Dr. Deming was making of, of it is really rooted in an understanding of all of that theory. And that comes back to rational prediction. When you talk about prediction, anybody can, pre I can predict anything, right? Um, but rational prediction is a different thing. It's, it's prediction based in theory um, that's testable by future experience. So in this case, we have a basis for predicting, since we have a, a stable process, we have a basis for predicting um, what the range of future results would be for continuation of the same process. So now we're kind of early into the learning process here, so, so how good is our judgment likely to be as far as continuation of the same process. Are we gonna really know what kinds of things matter and not? So my subjective degree of belief in that prediction is a lot less than if I'd run this experiment many times across a range of different conditions and had developed an understanding of what, what things m made a difference and what things didn't make a difference and it related that back to some more general body of theory. 
but we'll go ahead and make, make the prediction. All right, so directed experimentation. Um, this is where we try and increase the likelihood in a deliberate manner of an informative event occurring. So actively testing knowledge. So in my case, um, the first two experiments that I ran, um, I held my arm out horizontally. I saw lots of other examples, including a, what could easily become a workers' comp claim um, <laughs> on the <laughs> over, over in the corner over here. Um, so that's, that's what I did, right? But I didn't specify you could do any of these things. Um, you all used your best judgment. So I was like, well, try raising my arm. Um, why would I do that? Well, you'll see on this slide, the title says longer flight time equals better. So I didn't tell you guys that, right? Nobody seemed to have a problem with just kind of going ahead and, and doing this, but actually kind of what's good or better wasn't even defined um, with the initial experiment. Um, so there's all sorts of problems with how that initial experiment set up, right? We didn't say what's better. We didn't say what's acceptable um, from a, if there's some customer for this, for these flight times, what, what an acceptable flight time might be. Um, didn't really define flight time <laughs> properly. Certainly didn't operationally define it, right? Um, because there was all sorts of variation. You could use whatever measurement device you had. Um, so based upon observing the variation in practice, um, what one team would have considered a valid flight time to be might not be the same as another team. So you can imagine the trouble that this would cause if one of you is making these things and the other's the customer for it and you don't have agreement on, on what that really means. Right? So, so here we're gonna do, this is directed experimentation. It's like a first step of directed experimentation. We've gone from this informed observation, right, where we said, hmm, okay, special causes, what's going on, this is special, let's, let's make a change on that basis. And now, you know, where's this idea from, for raising the arm come from? It was a theory, right? It was a theory that if, it, if you start from a, a higher height, it's gonna take longer um, for the helicopter to, to fly towards ground, so. So you'll notice on this chart that I did not um, automatically recompute the control limits from a change in the process, right? So I changed the process, I made a deliberate change to the process. I have the extended control limits from, from the stable process of the second experiment. And then I'm using those control limits as a test of whether or not that change made a difference. If I just recomputed the control limits automatically and moved them, they'll move, right? It's a, the variation happens, it's a different set of data, they will move. Um, but, but did it make a difference? Did it, is it kind of a testable, um, observable difference? So in this case here, we see all points above the center line, so 20 points above the center line, that's special course signal. Lots, of, lots above the upper control limit, special course signal. So um, at least tentatively, we would say, yep, that change made a difference there. And if we're trying to maximize flight time, we're heading in the right direction. So now having done that test, having extended the previous control limits, um, now I have a basis for recomputing the control limits for that last set of data. Because I've established that this is a new process and, and recomputed the control limits for this set of data, which then for continuation of that process, um, I can continue that out into the process, so into the future. Now, one thing that we did do in that particular change there is if we kind of go back to the second experiment and say, what does continuation of the same process mean? The same arm height? Horizontal arm? Yes. Horizontal arm, of course. 
what, however you define horizontal arms. Um, but to the, it's continuation of that, because I know here if I change arm height, um, it causes a change in the process. So, so we, we have some knowledge that's been gained there that can improve the nature of, of prediction. So you can keep on going like that, right? Changing stuff like, oh, well, maybe this will make a difference, or maybe that'll make a difference. And, uh, ooh, maybe a better, could have used a better color for contrast there. But, um, but something else can happen uh, in, the, in the process of uh, kind of going through and, and making changes, and that's interactions. So interactions, at least the way a statistician would talk about an interaction, um, is that if you're, that the, the, the change from changing one variable is different dependent on what the, the condition of another variable is. So we, in kind of common language, we probably have a, a, a slightly more narrow de definition of interaction. It's like, uh, well, you don't want to take this drug and that drug at the same time because they interact and it has bad, bad consequences. Um, in this, it's that, that uh, uh, and there are interactions that are of that nature, right? So we, if we look at, uh, say, heat energy released from a spark, um, after a spark's there, um, if we have, um, if we have the, no hydrogen present, and I guess no, no other uh, combustible gas present, uh, and we add oxygen, and then we, um, and we, we have the spark in either case, it doesn't make any difference. But if we do have hydrogen present, um, then the presence of oxygen makes a difference to the amount of heat energy that's released when you have a spark. So that's more like your, your, um, your kind of traditional understanding of, uh, of what a, an interaction might be. Um, but so if you'd plotted these plots out and the lines are parallel to each other, um, they could be at an angle or whatever, but if these, these lines are parallel to each other, um, then the, the change due to one of the factors doesn't depend upon the level of the other factor. Um, and that, so there's no, no interaction between them. So, uh, okay, well, so why, why, am I, why am I bothering to talk about that? Well, you can see, if you think about the nature of interactions, that if all you ever do is just change one thing at a time, um, that you can, you can miss important conditions or you can misinterpret um, what, the, what the result is of, of a um, particular change. Right? So your, your changes, you're always looking at the change conditional on what the level is of all of these, these other factors. So in, in designed experiments, um, what we do is we try and make changes um, in factors in a systematic manner such that we have the opportunity to, to observe um, interactions um, between factors that we're, we're not uh, misled in our interpretation of results um, by interactions between factors. So when we look at this, um, we probably observed almost all of these potential causes of variation in outcome. Um, but this is kind of how we, how we start kind of in this experiment, more directed experimentation approach. Um, we ask for ideas of well, what kinds of things might impact helico helicopter flight time. And there's all sorts of things that can come, um, come out of that kind of a process. Um, here are a few examples of things that might potentially we know arm height does, uh, or at least did within the context of my experiment. Um, so we got all sorts of things, including things like design factors in the, in the, in the helicopter. So uh, am I done for time or? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I follow directions. Ian. Would you like to conclude quickly? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Please do. All right. So I picked three factors, um, kind of arbitrarily from this list. Um, paper, number of paper clips. So you actually had 
three or two or three paper clips available. You could do one, two or three paper clips. Um, arm height, high and low, and big wings and little wings. So kind of made it, redid did the, the cut on the top so you can have big wings and little wings. Did each one of these. And I just wanted to show you kind of use of the control chart maybe in a way that you'd not seen use of the control chart before. So what actually happened in the running of this experiment was, so there's eight different conditions there, each of those corners of the cube um, that you need to run as an experiment. So every one of those was run, and every one of those was run five times. Um, the order of all of the experiments was randomized for all the 40 experiments, and then these have been redrawn so that they're in relative time order within their particular combination. And on this graph here, um, you can actually look at the effects of multiple types of change simultaneously. So, you know, what's the, what's the effect of little wings versus big wings? So, from little wings to big wings, it went up. From little wings to big wings, it went up, up, up. So, it looks like big wings, if you wanted to maximize flight times, is the, the way to go, right? Well, what about the effect of one paper clip versus two paper clips? Well, from here to here is a comparison of one clip to two clips. So these, the average of these and the average of these goes, goes down. Same thing here, right, from little wings to big, from, sorry, one clip to two clips, so time goes down. So, so I don't want to use two paper clips if I'm wanting to maximize, maximize flight time. Um, and then uh, low arm height versus high arm height, that's kind of all these results versus all those results. Um, and you can see um, that in general, they all went up, so high arm height um, is better for higher flights. Now we also, we have in there, what well, looks like it might be a special cause signal um, with high arm height, one clip, and big wings. Right? Um, so you can do this a couple of ways. One way is, is to put individual sets of control limits on each of these sets of five data points. Um, or alternatively, you can subtract the average from each of these groups um, to create a set of residuals around the, the group average and then put them all on one 40-point control chart um, there based upon the, the original run order of the experiment. And uh, this, this is a preferable way to do it because it also, it also gives you an idea of what might, might, might have happened over the, the duration of the experiment. So you know, are the time-ordered effects, you can have time-ordered effects here like uh, does, the, does the helicopter wear out over time in some way because it's getting kind of abused or something of that sort or some particular thing's being changed. So, and to go back to, to the original thought of kind of the distinction that I'd like to try and make here, uh, we had accidental learning, right? Something happens and you just happen to be of the right mindset to pick up on it. And, and uh, then we, we kind of step up the game here with informed observation where we're using the control chart to actually direct our, our learning process. But it's, it's the way in which you've seen control charts used a lot. Right, the industrial wallpapering movement um, that happened, right, where they're just all over the place. And it's like, and then sometimes somebody learns something. And then you've got the intentional use here of like, I want to improve. I'm going to make changes in a deliberate and systematic manner and, so, and use the control chart as a part of a process for progressive uh, testing of ideas and um, aimed at improving. Is that quick enough? <laughs> That's wonderful if you're right. through. Yes. We're all about <laughs> quality here. <laughs> yes, sir, I'm through. Thank you very much, Ian. I think we should ask for at least one question from the audience. All right. And we've got just about four minutes of time. A question. I'll be right there with this microphone.
Uh, thank you. So my problem with using time as such a significant variable is if you're just charting it out and you give someone a chart and then you don't have any of the context behind it, like it's clear that like this last point is an outlier. But if I just give them this chart, do they know it's because of time? Do they know it's because, you know, like of some other variable? And like with the whole, you know, like moving range, if I just am continually getting worse, so it's 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, but then I'm starting off at three seconds and ending at one, alternatively, like when would you want to use a moving range versus just standard deviation or something like that? Um, okay, so there's actually several questions bundled together there. Right? Um, okay, so where, where would you want to use moving range versus standard deviation? Let's kind of start at the end there, right? Um, well, it, so it's always dependent on the context, right, as to what it, what it is that you're dealing with. Um, but um, almost always you want to have things displayed temporally. If you, if you look at the nature, you go back to Deming's management is prediction, right? So once we're in a position to be able to predict, then we can manage the, the business on that basis. Um, Prediction is basically in space and time. So um, when, you, when you look at the nature, it's, it's kind of what, what is the nature of the prediction that you're trying to make? Um, and there's kind of temporal or spatial um, prediction kind of a critical factor in that. You can, you can use the control chart in, in that context where you, you look at things from a spatial perspective rather than a temporal perspective, but it, it will mostly be on a time basis. Um, as far as the, the moving range goes, um, so the, the basic concept there is um, that you, you have an amount of variation that's exhibited between successive points of data um, that, other th that you're, you're taking as being kind of indicative of the underlying process at some level. Um, and so, so there's a, um, when, you, um, when you do things kind of on a collapse all of that temporal data and look at things from a standard deviation standpoint, um, you lose some of that time-based information. So uh, for instance, you, you said, well, things are getting progressively worse. Right? So if you have a, or progressively better, so you have some kind of a time-based progression in the data um, you look at the individual fluctuations, they may be relatively small, right? And then you've, you've got this thing that's kind of climbing the, over time. Um, you want to identify the climb as a special cause, right? Because something is, something's going on that's causing this process to change over time and it's gonna impact your ability to predict future outcomes. So when you do the moving range and you're looking at differences between successive points about that line, you're seeing kind of that short-term variation around the line, and it's relatively uninfluenced by that longer-term um, drift or shift or change in the, in the underlying process. So that, whereas if you took, uh, took that whole change and you said, okay, let's just lose the, the time-based view of that and just view it as being like a sample uh, in kind of traditional sampling terms, and so what's the standard deviation and so on? Well, the standard deviation has both that short-term variation around the underlying change and that whole change in it. So you're less likely to identify the change. You're gonna, it would inflate the control limits to where it would capture that. In, inappropriately from the perspective of a learning process, right, where you're trying to understand you know, what's going on, why are these things happening, and then how can I, given I have some desired outcome, how can I make changes based upon what I'm learning to move me towards that desired outcome? Does that yeah, help? Yeah, that okay. Great question, Jacob. Great answer. Ian. Thank you much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome.
And, and thank you for your gentle um, yes or no answer to a yes or no question, and thanks for throwing one right back at me. Demonstration of the power of open-ended questions as well as closed-ended questions. We, we have a great opportunity to tie in this idea of how do we know, and obviously after Ian's helped us to understand the power of just gathering the data and informing ourselves, it, it fits into this continuum of what we've been learning from the beginning. We created a crude chart, if you will, in the red bead experiment, and we've heard from a number of practitioners over yesterday and today about how important it is to get the data, and this experiment with the helicopter's perfect. Um, thank you very much for sharing that with us, Ian.